Okay. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And we're off with part four of the Sumati Dharika Sutra, otherwise known as the questions of the young maiden Sumati, whose name means subtle intellect or kind of a beautiful, wondrous mind. So, um, uh, like I said last time with part three, if you're here for part four, I don't need to go over with, with you what's going on here, right? Uh, this is uh, Ratnakuta Sutra number 30. This is the, well, something's happened, uh, but <laughs> hold off on that. Um, this sutra, the whole kind of premise of this sutra is that a young girl, eight years old, in fact, named Sumati, came to see the Buddha and asked 10 questions. And we have been going through these 10 questions, and we are on question 9 and 10 tonight. Um, and I'm going to dive basically more or less right in because we have a lot of ground to cover tonight. And... You, you might ask yourself, but Michael, there's only two questions left. It can't be that much ground to cover. Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, um, this sutra, there's a lot more to this sutra than just question nine and 10. This is going to be another one of those instances where uh, Garma Chang and company ha has let us down. They, they let us down again. And as usual, I, I don't like to be the bearer of bad news, um, but there are a lot of parts of this sutra that are missing from this English translation. And unfortunately, there's some of the most interesting parts. In fact, we already discovered, uh, I don't have my markers with me, but we discovered that the translators of this English version they just decided that you didn't want to know about how to be reborn on a thousand power, power petaled lotus flower and that you didn't want to know how to journey to multiple buddha lands so i made sure to do a fresh translation from the chinese of those for you that back when we did those and i kind of want to probably later on tonight return to those two questions because like I started saying, there's some more missing information. I've had to, to get busy today, wildfire fires burning and all, but I'm, I'm translating away here, um, hoping to get to the bottom of this. And I think I got to the bottom of it. So we're gonna get into that, um, but we can just roll right into Sumati's question number nine. We can roll right into that. I kind of want to just spend a little bit of time covering question nine and 10. Of course, if there's comments and epiphanies and questions, you know, we will take the time for those. But again, since this is part four, we're just going to dive in. This is the Buddha's answer to Sumati's question of how does one, uh, let's see, what was the language? Um, how does, how are evil deeds forever cast away? That's how they translated her question uh, number nine. And then the Buddha's response goes as such. The Buddha continued. Furthermore, Sumati, if bodhisattvas achieve, you guessed it, four things, they will be protected from demons. Yeah, well, I, I, pause. <laughs> protected from demons, right? Okay. Uh, is this some voodoo, voodoo stuff, Santaria or something? Like, what are we, what are we talking about? Well, uh, you know, let's just clarify what's going on here. The language that's being used here uh, with question number nine it's regarding Mara. You know Mara, right? Uh, this, uh, this being whose name means death. Indeed, Mara is sort of this personification of death, mortality, the moribund. All of that is wrapped up in this idea of Mara. But in Buddhism, Mara is also the tempter, 
the, you know, the harbinger of fear, all of these things. And so Sumati's question, and if, and if we remember from our past uh, part one, two, and three, if we remember Sumati's questions could and maybe should be read as if they're asking about a future rebirth. How could I in a future life, how could I be reborn with beautiful, graceful features? In a future life, how could I be reborn in a wealthy, noble family? And as I kind of um, interpreted the text, uh, the Buddha's answers are always going to be bringing this into the present. How can these things be achieved now, here and now? Not put off to some future time, some future rebirth, but how can I have beautiful, graceful features now? How can I be found in, among a wealthy, noble household now? And if you go back and reflect on the answers uh, in part one, two, and three, you'll remember or you'll notice that the Buddha is giving Sumati a slightly different meaning of graceful features. She may have thought, how do I become beautiful? And the Buddha is going to express how one becomes sort of beautiful in the eyes of others through acts of giving, kindness, not animosity and things like that. So num question number nine, Sumati is asking, what practices, what karma do I need to perform in order to be reborn in a world where there is no tempter, no death, no Mara, no evil one? Mara is often just translated as the evil one, right? It's important to know that the, this question is talking about Mara because while there are many, many demons, ghosts, goblins, you name it, in the world of Buddhist mythology, this question is not interested in demons, ghosts, and goblins. It's more in interested in this ultimate sense of evil, which is this being Mara. So furthermore, Sumati, if Bodhisattvas achieve four things, they will be protected from Mara. What are the four? to understand that all dharmas are equal in nature, to strive vigorously for progress, number three, to recollect the Buddha continually, and number four, to dedicate all good roots to the universal attainment of enlightenment. The world honor one repeated these answers in verse saying if one knows that all dharmas are equal in nature constantly makes energetic progress is ever mindful of the buddha and dedicates all roots of virtue to the attainment of buddhahood by all no mara can devise a way to attack them okay that's the answer to number nine, how to be protected from Mara, the evil one. I'm gonna go through these, you know, as I've done with all of these, I'm gonna go through these one by one. Um, and I'm also, the way I did it last, uh, the last uh, few parts, I've kind of condensed these answers down to one fundamental idea for us. So I'm gonna do that again as well. Um, I've also written here, this is the Buddha, of course, and this is his, uh, for me, it's the kind of, I wouldn't say it's the most important part, but it, for my Dharma talk tonight, it's the most important part. And it's the answer that he gives number one, uh, to understand that all Dharmas are equal by nature or equal in nature. Uh, this Jufa Ping Dang Xing, this all Dharmas having the same nature. Okay, so, you know, this is, this is tricky. It's always tricky for me um, on a Sunday night to just dive into the heavy stuff, right? You, the idea is usually you've built up to this through questions one through eight, and you're kind of very well primed for this type of uh, thinking. So I'm gonna do my best to, to get the wheels spinning here 
we we actually uh, I think uh, I think it was Dean last week asked the great question about this idea of dharmas. Always a tricky one. This this word dharma, um, you know, has so many meanings, so much uh, significance in Buddhism. And the answer to number one, in terms of how to be protected from Mara, is to understand that all dharmas have the same nature. So let's just quickly unpack that. Um, in this sense, dharmas, well, you know, the reason I, I mentioned this last time too, it's, it's nice when a translation just keeps the word dharma rather than choosing, oh, I don't know, like sometimes you could, it can mean truth, like capital T truth, the truth, right? So to understand that all truths are equal in nature. Sure, you could do that. But if you just did truth, eh, you might miss a little bit, right? And so we've also talked about how dharma can just not mean so much the truth or truth, but dharma can be a teaching. Like we say, the teachings of the Buddha, the dharma of the Buddha, giving a dharma talk, giving a, a teaching, right? And so this would be saying to understand that all teachings are equal in nature. Sure, great, you could do that one too. But there is a, a sort of what I feel like is the, mm, you know, if you want to get down to the bottom of this, it's helpful to know that in this case, they're using this word dharmas basically to refer to anything you could possibly see, hear, smell, taste, touch, or even think about any phenomena whatsoever, large or small, past, present, or future, uh, ephemeral, not ephemeral, doesn't matter. Anything that you could possibly conceive of with the 26 letters of the English alphabet and put into a word, an emotion, a color, it doesn't matter. Anything, even, even those 26 letters, all of that, all of the, it's a, those are dharmas. So this is the broadest kind of wildest sense of dharma within the Buddhist tradition, which is that it refers to any given phenomena that you could, again, that you could possibly imagine or think of. Doesn't, again, it doesn't even matter if it's a city or an atom. <laughs> it, it, again, they're equally a dharma. They're equally a concept. It's another, at, at this level that we're talking, concept is a translation of dharma idea is a concept is a, is a translation of dharma it, again it's just it's as broad as you could even imagine in that sense and so then that makes this statement quite profound to say that to understand that all phenomena all things all ideas all concepts anything you could possibly imagine are all equal in nature right I know you think that a hundred dollars is more than a dollar. <laughs> I know you think that, you know, whatever, uh, a city is bigger than an atom, whatever. But this is actually this profound Buddhist statement that insofar as all of this stuff is ideas, are ideas, insofar as they are ideas, they all have the same nature of being an idea, of being a concept. Th that's just the beginning. That's just my ante for this idea of, of understanding all dharmas have the same nature. Now, you know, I can already tell from everybody in the Zoom room here, right, is that everybody knows about shunyata, the emptiness, the empty nature of all phenomena, right? Maybe you know the, about the dependently originated nature of all phenomena. All of these ideas that we've talked about in the past will help you understand this idea that to see all phenomena as equal, that is how to escape Mara. I don't, I don't wanna to dwell too long on this one because again, we have a lot of ground to cover tonight. And, and by the way, in the juicy parts that I'm going to get to later that aren't in the English translation, they get back to this idea of the equality of all dharmas. 
In fact, the crown prince of the Dharma, Manjushri and Sumati, have a, an amazing back and forth regarding this empty nature of all dharmas or that, that all phenomena have the same nature. So if, if everybody's comfortable, I'd like to just kind of keep it rolling. But obviously, cool. So just keep that in mind. So to view all phenomena as equal, but equal in nature, right? That it has, that at the bottom, they all have the same nature. They're all arising from the same phenomena in that sense, or from the same principles. Number two, the number two way to be protected from Mara is to strive vigorously for progress. This is a um, kind of, um, this is one that we could either spend all night on, or I could just paraphrase it quickly with, give it your all. <laughs> give it your all, right? But really what's going on here is, and in fact, I've actually summarized the answer to number nine with this Buddhist idea of virya, determination, or uh, viyama, this kind of, um, oh, this kind of drive, this, this investigation, this kind of idea of this like, um, well, uh, the best one is virya. And virya is this, um, it's a quality in Buddhism, which is this, well, striving vigorously. And the most important thing I can say about virya, that it gets translated as determination, I like to translate it as drive, you know? Um, but whether you're determined, whether you're driven, um, what's the most important aspect about this idea is that a lot of people often ask, you know, they, they, they find out about some Dharma, clinging, attachment, the problems with clinging and attachment, the, 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 all of that. And so it inevitably arises in the mind of a young Dharma student isn't wanting enlightenment like a, a form of wanting? Isn't, like, isn't that what the Buddha said not to do? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and so if you are striving and clinging and wanting enlightenment, if, sadly, you will never get, get it. It will actually be like the proverbial carrot that just, oh. So what, what virya is, this idea, idea of drive or determination is this sort of answer to that, that question. And it's this idea that the reason why a bodhisattva strives for enlightenment or goes for enlightenment is not because they want to or, or anything, it's that they're driven to. And I would ask you to reflect in your own life on the slight difference between something that you feel driven or determined to do, you know, and, you know, I don't know if it's uh, maybe you get up every morning and, and, and run five miles or something like that. And this idea that you get up every morning and you're just driven to do that. Maybe there's not even any greater goal. You're not trying to run a marathon or even be healthy, but it's really just an end to itself in the sense that you really just wouldn't want to, sit around in your bed all morning. You, you would like, you're driven to go run. And again, not for any desirous reason, but just because of an inner drive to do so. That's very close to this idea of virya, where you are just driven to do something, you know? And it's like, again, if, or if it's like a musical instrument and you're just driven, you're like, you really want to get good at it. And somebody's like, wow, you want to be in a band or you want to be on MTV or famous or something? And you're just like, no, I just want to get good at it. That's it. That's sort of the idea of this virya. And this is the answer in number two, which is to strive vigorously for progress. But it is not in any kind of frantic, uh, clingy way. But it is this idea of, well, if you wanted to flip it, don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. <laughs> Mara, Mara loves lazy people. <laughs> okay, that's number two. Everybody feeling good? No?
Yeah, yeah sorry. I just oh, took yeah. me a moment to unmute. Uh, what is, is, can you repeat it, uh, or explain what Viyama is? I'm not familiar with that. Ah, Viyama is this, uh, what, that's the, that investigation, it's part of, it's a factor of enlightenment, I believe. And it's sort of related to the same idea of a curiosity drivenness, but without, but without the striving. So I would actually, I would just, because the, the text uses neither of those, I'm summarizing it with either, but I would go with virya. It's much more, of course, virya is one of the bodhisattva, the paramitas of the bodhisattva path. So I really think that's what answer number two is pointing at. Number three is interesting, to recollect the Buddha continually. This is another one that we could be here all night just talking about this one idea. Um, the, what's being translated as recollect the Buddha continually. You know, that's a, it's a really tricky one because the Sanskrit, as far as I know, and again, we don't have a Sanskrit version of this Sumati Sutra, so we're not totally sure, but um, a good guess, there is this uh, Buddha Smriti, or uh, Smriti is the Sanskrit for Sati. Sati is our mindfulness. We all, know, we, we all know about mindfulness, right? The Buddhist practice of mindfulness called Sati in Pali, or Smriti in Sanskrit. And something that happens that, that's interesting in the Mahayana tradition is that while, while in the earlier kind of um, in the early school of Buddhism, well, you're probably familiar with the four foundations of mindfulness. That's, it's, a, it's a very, very famous uh, Pali Sutta in which the Buddha gives the premier uh, discourse on sati, on mindfulness. And there are these four foundations of mindfulness, bringing awareness to the body, primarily through the breath and respiration then bringing awareness to sensations, sensations of the organs, sensations of the body, all that. Number three, bringing awareness to mind states, citta, if you're angry, if you're sad, just noticing mind states. And then number four is actually being mindful of dharmas, <laughs> being mindful of truths, being mindful of Buddhist principles, things like that. So in the original form of Buddhism, there, you kind of had four foundations of mindfulness. One thing that happens in, the, in this uh, emerging Mahayana tradition is they introduce the idea of the Buddha as a foundation of mindfulness. This is called Buddha Nashmurti or just Buddha Shmurti, mindfulness of the Buddha. And so what number three is talking about is essentially constantly, constantly, continually doing the practice of being mindfully aware of the Buddha. What does that look like? Well, that's where it gets complicated because I need you to know, I would like you to know that the number three here, recollect the Buddha continually, do Buddha mindfulness, Buddha Smriti all the time. That number three, that, that practice of mindfulness of the Buddha becomes its own school of Buddhism. This kind of devotional form of Buddhism, sometimes it's called Pure Land Buddhism. Um, uh, you know, the Japanese Buddhism is very into this idea of kind of being mindful of the Buddha, but in the form of a statue and kind of what we would what would look like worship and reverence and prayer and all of that to this image. I want you to know that the entire pure land devotional form of Buddhism seems to be coming from this simple idea of being mindful of the Buddha. But before you go off doing that, which that's great, I want you to know, as we have talked about in a bunch of answers to other questions, you know, there's a lot of ways to interpret this. And because, well, it gets tricky, you know, because the, 
the Vajra Sutra, my favorite, the di- otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra. The Vajra Sutra has this very famous line, and it says, the, the Buddha in it says, if, if you go looking for me by sight or searching for me by sound, you will you, you'll never see me. But he says, anybody that seeks me by sight or searches by sound is walking the wrong path and they will never see the Buddha. And this is sort of going, I mean, this is probably a good thing for me to do, which is introduce this idea of enlightenment, liberation. <laughs> and if you, if you know the Vajra Sutra, then you know that the meaning of that poem where he says, don't, don't go looking for me with your eyes and go hearing for me with your ears. In the Mahayana tradition, the Buddha, Tathagata, enlightenment, Nirvana, all these ideas, they are very well understood to be beyond anything that could be is a, is a sight with the eyes beyond anything that could be a sound, a smell, a taste, even a tactile, or even a thought. So the Buddha is beyond conceptualization in that sense. The, the, this Buddha, the Vajra Buddha, where it's like, whoa, well then what is that? Where is that? How is that? That sense of Buddha as being unconditioned, a samskrita, beyond in that sense. It's interesting to keep that Buddha in mind, that one, when answering, or when thinking about number three, to, to recollect that Buddha continually. And if you're sitting there going, wait, which one? Hold on, wait, what did... The, the I can't I can't really do it again. But the idea is there's multiple ways to interpret Buddha, and it could be a nice statue that you are kind of always mindful of, or it could be this profound idea of the unconditioned that one is always mindful of. Either way, it's going to keep Mara at bay. That's that's the that's at the end of the day. That's that's what he's saying. Okay, everybody good on number three. Again, a lot of what these, the last two answers, or the last two that we're working on, they're gonna get repeated in the, the discourse. It's really fun. So, uh, so unless you're like totally lost, we're gonna keep going. Number four, the number four way, the number four practice in order to keep Mara away is to dedicate all good roots to the universal attainment of enlightenment. Uh, the Chinese actually just says to dedicate all good roots it is just understood within the discourse of Mahayana Buddhism that that is dedicating all good merit, all good, every, all the good that good merit or good roots that one has attained, one dedicates them to the, the uh, to the universal attainment of enlightenment. That not, I'm not doing all of this for my enlightenment. <laughs> We're doing all of this for all of our enlightenment. And if I could just say one uh funny maybe it might be funny if i could say one funny thing to to give you a sense of how this works from a bodhisattva point of view <laughs> so th- th- this is a this is like a uh a primary bodhisattva practice to dedicate all merit for universal salvation but i always like to joke that there's something funny about that and what's funny about that is you don't even know the kind of merit you get from dedicating all of your good merit to the universal salvation of all beings. You get crazy merit from that. So you know what you got to do? You got to give that away. <laughs> but oh my gosh, do you know what? Do you know how much merit you get when you give away all the merit that you got from dedicating all the good roots <laughs> to the universal enlightenment? Wow. And then you've got to, <laughs> and maybe now you're see. oh, wow, the Bodhisattva practice is pretty profound. If it is this sort of constant dedicating of good roots and good merit to all sentient beings, for which one is being heaped with all kinds of good merit, and then again, that's just given away. Um, and I so that's I- the number four way to keep Mara at bay, is just to keep 
it paying it forward, as we would say in the West, right? <laughs> hey, Michael, I have a question, a general question. Perfect timing. About um, the four um, practices to keep Mara away. Um, could you potentially say it's a general question that this is a Mahayana approach. Um, would you say that a Vajrayana approach would be more in more like uh, working with Mara? I mean, in the sense, because Vajrayana, they work a lot of with disturbing emotions, right? Like they work with it. They don't want to like push it away or reject it or not meet them, but really work them as qualities also being like qualities that support the path to enlightenment, right? So mm -hmm. would you make this distinction or? Yeah, let me, let me process that for a moment. Sh should I ask the question more clear? Or nope, I got it. Okay. I got it. Um, yeah, okay. I think the, the idea, uh, let's, 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 uh, let's get clear about Mara. Yeah, we, you know, uh, if you look at mandalas and Vajrayana art, uh, Mara has a an image, a visage, and and all of that. And, and it, um, but let's not get too carried away with the personification of this. Mara is this sort of you know, um, you know. Let's let's take suffering. Let's take some you know really. Um, oh, you know, let's take some really bad stuff. There's two things going on here. What you're describing, Connie, is this, the, you know, the, the, there's these, um, oh, this gets tricky, but it's about when one is encountering suffering or has suffering, then there are a variety of Buddhist practices for dealing with that. You could do an old school Theravada style, just try to calm down. Uh, you could do the Mahayana Bodhisattva move of sort of trying to uh, work it out through uh, interactions with others. And then what you're describing, Connie, is this third turning Vajrayana way of actually sort of like not running away from Mara and not um, sort of helping everybody else deal with Mara, but actually sort of the Vajrayana move of like working with Mara. Mm. Yes, totally, mm. totally, 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 yes. However, I don't, I want to make clear that what Sumati is asking is about, I, I'd like to be in a world that doesn't have it at all. Mm. So I don't even have to like get friendly with Mara to deal with it, to, to get it, like get beyond it. If, do you know what I mean, Connie? Yeah, yeah sure. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of if, if it's happening, mm -hmm. then, you know, yeah, there's techniques to deal with it. But then there's also, I guess, you know, maybe call these preemptive moves, right? These are a little preemptive to try to keep Mara away. But then if Mara still, you know, find, like, you know, puts on the disguise and sneaks back into the world, then we can pull out our Vajrayana techniques. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. cool. Any other questions about number nine? Again, I've sort of summarized all these down to this idea of virya, determination or drive, because definitely that, that practice of giving all the merit and then getting the merit and giving it and getting it and giving it and just a constant practice of that, that's a def definitely a virya determination type of, a, of an activity. Continually keeping the Buddha in mind is kind of a virya-esque thing and certainly striving vigorously is and then this one understanding that all dharmas have the same nature so okay plenty of time everybody good number 10 let's just uh, go back really quick um Oh yeah, this was, this was a very interesting one. Uh, Sumati's original question was, and at the end of one's life, how may one see many Buddhas? And then free, free of pain, free of suffering, free of dukkha, hear them preach the pure Dharma. So 
the Buddha's answer. But the Buddha continued, furthermore, Sumati, if bodhisattvas achieve four things, Buddhas will appear to them at the time of their death. And what are the four? To satisfy those in need of charity. Number two, to understand and deeply believe in virtuous practices. Number three, to provide bodhisattvas with adornments. And number four, to make frequent offerings to the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The World Honor One repeated this in verse saying, one who fulfills the needs of a seeker understands and believes in the profound Dharma, furnishes bodhisattvas with adornments, and makes frequent offerings to the three jewels, those fields of blessings. That person will see Buddhas when they die. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> More to come. But let's just deal with the answer to question number 10. Again, at a very surface level, Sumati is asking this kind of question of, I've heard, I've heard people say, <laughs> that they they continually keep the Buddha in mind, they pray to Buddha, what have you. I've heard people say that when they die, Buddha, Amitabha, Amida Buddha comes from the heavens and comes and scoops them up and takes them away to a heaven. Sumati's like, I, I heard that that's what ha can happen. How can I make sure that when I die, I see Buddhas and that I can get to hear them preach the Dharma, right? And so the number one way to do that is to satisf satisfy those in need of charity. <laughs> right? And I particularly like the Buddha's rephrasing of it in the poem where he says, it's uh, by one who fulfill fulfills the needs of a seeker. Love it. The seeker, yeah. So, you know, this is... Um, even though number two, number two was heavily about dana and giving, this one is sort of this unique particular one about sort of like satis uh, satisfying the needs of seekers, those striving, you know, those on a path in a way. So this is, it could be interpreted as just giving, but I actually think there's a slightly more nuanced uh, thing going on here. Um, again, there's a lot I could say about this, but I'm going just for the sake of time, I'm going to have to just tell you my interpretation very quickly, very bluntly. If you remember what I was saying about how all the Buddha's answers are kind of twisting this in a way that maybe Sumati or me and you didn't see coming, right? And as we talked a lot about with, um, all the Buddha land stuff. And I went off for uh, one night, I went off for a while about objective reality and subjective reality and trying to really, you know, create a, a nice, interesting picture of how this Mahayana thing works, where, you know, about this idea of ev all beings having the Buddha nature, all sentient beings already being enlightened. We, we just all kind of forgot kind of a thing. And so this is very much operating on that level of we are all already Buddhas, just haven't figured that out yet in a way. My feeling about this is, is again, at a surface level, the question might be asking, how do I get Buddhas to come, you know, from some other planet to visit me? And I, my feeling is the Buddha is saying here, well, if you satisfy the need, the, uh, the, those in need of charity, if you, if you help others, right, that, well, you know, just to, again, just to put this bluntly, I think the idea is that if you do this practice number one, you, will, you won't find yourself dying alone. Question, Michael? Yeah, Fred. Yeah. Uh... Do you see differences in, in uh, Eastern understanding of, of charity and Western? I'm curious about Buddhist versus Christian uh, differences mm. in what that means. 
Yeah, I mean, whew, that's a great question, Fred. Um, yeah, there's a there's a big difference. Uh, somebody should write a book or a dissertation about that one. Um, and I would, <laughs> yeah, there, I, got, I already have a bibliography a mile long on that one. Um, Cause there's a lot, I mean, yeah, there's just a lot going on there, but I, just to answer, give you one nice answer, I, I do, you know, I'm kind of, when it comes to Western philosophy, I'm very Nietzschean, I'm really into Nietzsche, and Nietzsche had this whole critique of Christian charity, and I'm on board with the Nietzschean critique of Christian charity. Nietzsche's critique of Christian charity is that ch charity in a certain way can be a little backhanded in that it keeps you down and it keeps me up because I'm the, I'm the nice guy here. Here's a little bit, here's a little bit for you. And so I, my little charity makes me a great guy and makes you pity a pitiful, literally pitiful, like uh, worthy of pity. Oh, you poor, sad little person here. Here you go. Bye. That's the Nietzschean critique of Christian charity that it's totally hypocritical in a lot of different ways. And you could read up on that, Twilight of Idols, ha, you know, have a field day. Whereas the entire Donna, Donna project, which sometimes charity is the way that people translate Donna, which is unfortunate because it doesn't mean charity and it can be conflated with Christian charity. The word isn't charity, it's Donna giving. And Donna, of course, is where we get the English word donation, donor, and all of that. And so Donna, you know, especially the Bodhisattva practice of Donna, it is like almost the exact opposite of that Christian way I described. And by the way, I don't want to put down any Christians. I was quoting Nietzsche. I was not, I'm not putting down ch charity in that sense. It's just sort of a doctrinal problem with Christianity. No problems with Christians, but a little problem with the doctrine. In that way. So, that good, Fred? Okay. Any other questions on the first one? Uh, number two, to understand and deeply believe in virtuous practices. You know, virtuous practices are the giving, the selfless giving that we are just describing. Um, it, many, many virtuous practices are involved in the bodhisattva path, moral discipline, patience, on and on. And so this number two is sort of about, it, it, again, it's not doing the practices. Obviously you do the practices, obviously you do them. But this one is actually about understanding and deeply believing in those practices. And so that's a slightly different thing there, right? Because if somebody told you about dana and selfless giving, you might be like, oh, great, I'll give it all, I'll give it all away. And you just start giving and giving and giving, and you're like, oh, am I, I'm a good bodhisattva, right? I'm just giving and giving and giving. And there's a way that you could do that, and that would be that would be great, of course. But this is saying, but it it would be even cooler, and you would you would see see Buddhas when you die, if you understood and believed in the deeper uh, meaning, the deeper like the the deeper virtue of these practices. And so, in in many ways, actually, Fred, your your question was awesome in terms of that understanding the depth of selfless giving and how, you know, I think, um, I don't think Katie's in the Zoom room tonight, you know, but Katie had, has wonderful things to say about Donna as a liberating exercise, that it's, it's liberating to give. It doesn't just get you married or whatever, that it's actually in a, a sneaky way, a liberation exercise. And if you can kind of probe to the depths of that and be like, oh, wow, wow, like that form of giving is good for, for the recipient and it's good for me. Like it's like a super win-win. And if you understand 
and, and believe in the depth of that virtue of that selfless giving, and I'm just choosing you know, one virtuous practice, this is saying that it's sort of like that's, well, we're at, we're at, we're at question number 10. So this is a premier bodhisattva action to understand and deeply believe in the value of these virtuous practices. Right? Okay, this is the most interesting one. This was the, the one I wanted to focus on for this one, to provide bodhisattvas with adornments. This word adornments, uh, it's sometimes um, translated as a vyuha. A vyuha is, is a, an interesting Buddhist idea. The, the word arrangement or adornment, this idea, it's so interesting. I mean, at, at first blush, you would think they're talking about jewelry, adornments, right? Earrings, things like that. And they're not. Um, or it, or it, it gets tricky, though, because it's like things can be symbolic. And so it gets very tricky. But what I mean to say is, is that uh, and I'm already kind of running a little short on time, so I, I, I'm going to have to scrunch this one too. But this, oh, this adornment idea in Buddhism is, oh, it has a lot to do with, this is a tricky word. This is a tricky term and a tricky word, but it kind of has to do with glorification has to do with glory, uh, 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 kind of this sort of um, beatification, the beatific. I'm using a lot of Christian words just because we don't have a lot of other ones in English in that way. But to provide bodhisattvas with adornments is, well, I, I, at the end of the day, I want to say, I don't know. I don't know exactly what they're talking about. My, my heart kind of knows in a way but on, in that interpretive level, I'm not exactly sure. It's definitely sort of about honoring bodhisattvas, adornments. Um, oh, again, this is just such, it's a beautiful idea, especially when you start to get, especially when you start to get into the idea of, of like, well, like truth and like these, um, well, this Dharma, right? But this, these, 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 this beautiful teachings and this truth and this light and this wisdom, bodhisattvas are adorned with that light and that wisdom. That's, those are adornments. Truth, uh, thing, you know, they're, they're subtle. Again, they're not earrings and, and clothes in that way, but in the very same way that you could, uh, yeah, it gets too complicated, but there's a very similar thing going on where even in, you know, oh, this Christianity stuff, but there's in Christianity, this sort of like these glorification robes, these robes of glory that they're not talking about a robe, but it could look like a, a robe. And of course the robes in for a, a monastic, are adornments in that way too. But they're not maybe necessarily talking about the cloth. So again, it's just a beautiful poetic idea, adornments as it pertains to the bodhisattva and the bodhisattva practice. Yeah, it's just a wonderful idea. And it's this, uh, yeah, Zhuangyan. Zhuangyan is just a, this is a wild idea. <laughs> and it's it's very very hard if you go doing your homework it's very hard to get a straight answer on on like what that means so anybody's got any epiphanies or ideas on that i mean yeah no well I, well I sort of have a question about it because it sounds like it sounds like you were saying that bodhisattvas are adorned by their wisdom, by their truth, by their light. But we're being told that in order to see Buddha as the end of life, we should be adorning them with things. So, yep. Uh, yep. And, and it gets tricky. It gets yeah. tricky. 
if I if I were to tie this back to see this is where it gets very very tricky because if I were to tie this back to the last answer about continually keeping the Buddha in mind and that in practice that actually looks like um, revering a Buddha statue in practice well furnishing bodhisattvas with adornments can in if you go to japan they put like the on the jizo right the kishiti guard but they put the little red bib that's but that little statue of jizo the kishiti garba bodhisattva he doesn't need clothing so but to do that you know right that's the that's the act that as you can imagine or you might be able to put together how that might lead to seeing Buddhas or Bodhisattvas when one dies. But sorry, if I can follow up on that. So is yeah. that like symbolically adorning them with truths and dharmas and the things yeah, that make them where, adorned? Yeah, like that, that's where it gets tricky. Putting the bib, the bib on there is sort of symbolically doing that? Yep. And that's where it gets tricky because it is like literally adorning them. But one wouldn't, I don't think one would want to get too hung up on the physical cloth of it, that it's the act, right? Yeah. And by the way, you know, I interpret these things, like I said, because if you read all four together, you can get a better sense. And so if you look at the answer number four, to make frequent offerings to the three jewels, to the Buddha, to the Dharma, and the Sangha. That's a classic, and whether it's old school Theravada Buddhism or Mahayana or Vajrayana, giving gifts, making offerings to the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, that's as old as it gets. And that's definitely a guaranteed way to see Buddhas when one dies. Um, by the way, the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, well, let's go backwards. The Sangha is traditionally the community of monks and nuns, but it could also just be the, the SFDC, our Sangha here. And so giving to the Sangha is providing for the needs of the community. That's what that means. To make offerings to the Sangha is to provide for the needs of the community. To make offerings to the Dharma is a little trickier, but it's usually things like education, copying out sutras. Um, it's about uh, the knowledge and making offerings to the knowledge. And so in practice, that is usually making offerings of paper, pencils, and pens and things to a Buddhist community so that they can learn. That's making offerings to the Dharma. And making offerings to the Buddha is traditionally an altar with a Buddha statue and making offerings to the Buddha, but you could get a little more mystical about it in terms of making offerings to enlightened beings or something like that. But I want you to know that the making offerings to the Sangha is about sustaining the lives of the members of the Sangha. Making offerings to the Dharma is about sustaining the teaching, sustaining the Dharma. Making offerings to the Buddha. Why, the Buddha doesn't eat oranges. Why do I put oranges? Like, what's up with that one? Well, it actually seems to me from reading a lot of this stuff and, and you know, just trying to figure out what they were talking about, there's a lot of connections with making offerings to the Buddha and the beautification of the world. That's why you build a beautiful temple and it's all full of beautiful candles and beautiful incense and it's this peaceful, serene sanctuary. It makes the world a more beautiful, safe place. That's an offering to the Buddha. Just one example. Again, you could interpret this a lot of different ways. But like I said, making offerings to the three jewels, to the triple gem, is definitely a surefire way to see Buddhas when you die. Um, yeah, everybody good? Because it's about to get fun. <laughs> okay, perfect. So here's the thing I already mentioned at the end of question number 10, dot, dot, dot. 
And in this book, we have learned that when it says, when it's an ellipsis, dot, 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 it could mean that they left out a word, it could mean they left out a sentence, or in this case, it, they left out several pages of text. <laughs> they left out in an entire uh, thing. And I actually, I'm going to read it. I did a translation, like I said, I was translating this this week. And I'm going to read to you my translation of the Chinese of, of what happens next. All right. So this is what happens after the Buddha gives his, his 40 part answer to Sumati's questions. When Sumati heard what the Buddha said, she asked, World honored one, the Buddha has explained these practices as practices of the Bodhisattva, and I will faithfully practice them. World honored one, if I were to fail to practice even one among these 40 practices, then I would be contradicting the teachings of the Buddha and I would slander the Tathagata. Okay. So that's what that's what she says in response. She's like, wow, this is great. When I first started reading the Chinese, I was like, oh, that's, that's why they left this out. Because she says this thing about 40 practices. But they, they, Dharma Chong and company, they already, they already got rid of eight, eight of the practices because they didn't give you these answers. So I was reading this, I was like, oh, okay, for some reason, they left out those, those, the answers to those questions, bringing the, so there wasn't 40 answers. So this little, um, these two sentences of Sumati wouldn't make sense. I, so I gave them the benefit of the doubt. And I was like, okay, I understand why you didn't translate that. It's okay. But then, then the venerable Maha Madhulyayana, you know Madhulyayana, right? The, he's got the, the superpowers. He's, he's the one. He's, he's, the, he's the Buddha's left hand man, his tantric master. So then the venerable Maha Magulyayana said to Sumati, the practices of the Bodhisattva are very difficult to practice. Have you realized this rare great will of yourself? And by the way, this, we've seen this question before when we've had sutras where it's a, a woman or a girl or a young girl discoursing with monks or other bodhisattvas. This question of like, hey, like, did, did you just think of this all by yourself? <laughs> That's basically what the question is. And again, we've seen it in other sutras. Did you just think of this all by yourself? <laughs> Sumati answered. M Sumati said to the venerable, uh, and this is a little tricky too, because um, I, you know, wildfires and everything. So my translation is not perfect. But there's a word that is, I, it's about, so she says that if the expansiveness of my vow, the word is literally expansiveness, but it probably just means greatness. So the, if the greatness of my vow is true and not false, then I shall have command of all bodhisattva practices and achieve the state of completion, i.e. full Buddhahood, nirvana, the whole nine. Thus willing this 3,000 great thousand world system to quake in six different ways and for heaven to rain down wondrous flowers and heavenly drums to sound of themselves. And when these words were spoken, flowers scattered from the sky as if raining from heaven and heavenly drums sounded of themselves as the 3,000 great thousand world system quaked in six ways. Then Sumati said to Madhulyayana, it is because my words are true that in the future I shall attain Buddhahood just like the Tathagata Shakyamuni. And when I do, in my country, there will be no deeds of Mara, no actions of Mara, and there will not even be the names of evil paths for women. 
if my words are not delusional, may I now become a great being with a body the color of gold. And when Sumatsi had finished saying these words, she turned into a great being with a body the color of gold. At that time, the venerable Mahamagulyayana arose from his seat, bared his right shoulder, placed his head at the Buddha's feet. He addressed the Buddha saying, world honored one, I now revere this initial determination for supreme unsurpassable enlightenment and all bodhisattva mahasattvas. That's what they left out. That, or, that's the first thing they left out. Why would they leave that out? By the way, the Chinese is not that hard. So they did not leave it out because they were like, well, you know, what's this say? Well, let's, you know, it's very simple. Why would they leave that out? I wonder. I'm starting to detect a pattern to Garma Chung and company in terms of what they <laughs> conveniently leave out. They seem very selective actually in what they leave out. And what they leave out is when a senior monk bows down to an eight year old girl. And, and by the way, if you didn't catch it, Madhuyayana, he's like, oh, Oh, the, the initial determination for enlightenment in Bodhisattva. So it's important to remember that he represents that old school Theravada way that says no woman ever achieves enlightenment. That's part of the old school Theravadan thing that women are, no, 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 you got to get reborn as a man first. Then you, you have a shot at Buddhahood. So this this whole thing that just happened turns that whole doctrine on its head. And again, in terms of uh, sex and gender and all of this, this is radical. <laughs> this is so radical. And it's really unfortunate that they, that they left it out. Questions, comments, ideas about that? Because it gets better. <laughs> yeah, Tanya. How long ago was this translated? Was this, is this translation? Hmm. 76, I want to say. Hold on, I'm looking. Oh, no, well, it was printed in 83, but I believe they did the translations uh, quite before that. So, again, I, yeah, I haven't, I, mean, I even, ha I haven't wanted to throw them under the bus. I really haven't. But I'm at the point now where, again, it's too consistent where it's like, uh-oh, we got another woman that's being praised by a man. We better get, get that out of there. And it, again, one has to wonder why, um, especially when we're dealing with the Dharma here, right? It's like, I don't know. That's a, uh, okay. So that, first that happens, that our old school monk, who by the way, uh, if, uh, again, is like known for having these superpowers, being able to change like his body, for example. And so for Sumati to basically say, if I'm telling the truth, then let it rain, among, you know, great flowers from the sky and let me have a golden body. And show enough, flowers from the sky and a golden body, right? So after that happens, and now I am, I'm back in the book. I'm back in the book for a little while. This is where we get to the juicy dialogue with the Prince of the Dharma, Manjushri. And I was having so much trouble with their translation, I just kept going. So I'm reading from my translation. It's not as different. There's a few words here and there, but. Then Manjushri, Dharma Prince, asked Sumati, in what dharma do you abide that you are able to make such a vow that makes it rain flowers and turn your body cool? In what dharma do you abide? Let me clarify the question really quickly. It's another, you know, use of the word dharma. In this instance, I think it's safe to understand that what Manjushri is asking is, 
Yeah, he's kind of asking in in what teaching do you abide? Like, what what teaching is this? What did you? What did the Buddha tell you? Right. So he's kind of asking that. But whenever this word abide pops up in a Buddhist sutra, they're kind of talking, or at least implying a meditative state. And this is where if you, if, you, if you are familiar with the Brahma Viharas, the abodes of Brahma, the abodes, well, what do you do in an abode? You abide. And so the idea of like being in the, Bra in the, the Brahma Viharas and abiding in those, these questions when they are asked, and you know, this happens in all of these super, sutras, it's quite formulaic, Manjushri asks, in what dharma do you abide that you are able to make such a sincere vow? He's asking like, whoa, where are you? At what level of the dharma are you at? And Sumati replies, Manjushri, that's no kind of question. Why? Because within the realm of dharma, within the dharma dhatu, there is nowhere to abide. Manjushri asked again, what is called enlightenment? Actually, it's what is called bodhi. Yep, they just translated as what is bodhi. It's uh, with Buddhist texts, you should never gloss, as Chinese, you should never gloss over when they are asking about names and what things are called versus like, it's a very big difference, actually. It's a very big difference to ask what is enlightenment versus what actually is asked, which is what is called enlightenment. It's actually two different things because Manjushri's question is like, like what is called enlightenment? Bo and the word is Bodhi, and it's actually very helpful to uh, linguistically to keep it as bodhi because it's going to be related to bodhisattva. So if it's, if you translate it as enlightenment and then bodhisattva, you're going to miss a play of words. So Manjushri asks, what is bodhi or what is called bodhi? And Sumati replies, well, in this, in this one, non-discrimination is bodhi. It's trickier than that though, but to not discriminate any dharma, that is what is called bodhi. That is enlightenment. That's Sumati's answer. It's very, very related to question eight, all dharmas having the same nature. This is more about discriminating, discriminating this from that. We've, we've had these conversations in the past about, you know, Buddhism and, and dharma, is very, very uh, focused on discrimination. We're, uh, we're very interested in getting rid of discrimination. Yes, we are very, very interested in getting rid of discrimination. But what's important from a Buddhist point of view to know is that that discrimination starts at the most basic level of separating this from that. Then this is good and that's bad. But first you just discriminate this from that. Then you start heaping labels on that which has been discriminated. This is saying, or Sumati is saying is that to not discriminate this from that, that is what is called enlightenment. Everybody doing good? And, and, and this is a beautiful classic Manjushri repartee. So it's, it's, they're going deeper and deeper and deeper. And so Manjushri asks, what's called enlightenment? Sumati says that Dharma without discrimination, that's called Bodhi or enlightenment. Manjushri again asked, Who's, who is called a Bodhisattva? <laughs> Number of different ways to interpret this, but he's basically saying, who's a Bodhisattva and who ain't? What? What is called a bodhisattva? And Sumati's answer, which 
they 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 kind of mess it up a little a little bit but they say one who knows that all dharmas have the same nature as empty space that's a bodhisattva my translation is cuz her, her answer is much more cryptic in a really cool way when manjushri asks who's a bodhisattva sumati replies all dharmas are equal to empty space. That's called a bodhisattva. <laughs> and it's actually a very careful way out of some linguistic traps that, that she is very aware of. She's already avoiding those traps. And so there's this idea, uh, you know, I don't, I can't, uh, it's getting too late, but this idea of space or akasha, right? And as I always say, we're not talking about outer space. We're not talking about black void space. We're just talking about uh, space, like between things, right? And so what's important from a dharmic point of view about akasha or space is that space isn't anything but it's and it allows for there to be things because if there were no room for things there would be no place for them to be no space so space is this weird like quality or something to reality but again it's not a thing sumati's answer is that all phenomena all dharmas that have the same nature, they all have the same nature as that space. That's called a bodhisattva. <laughs> Manjushri then asked again, well then what are called the practices of enlightenment? If you see, Manjushri's questions are very, very interesting because if Sumati keeps like getting rid of everything in this kind of either shunyata or the equality of all dharmas, then Manjushri is like, so then what are the practices of a bodhisattva then? <laughs> if there's, what will we And she answers, Sumati replies, is practices that are like mirages and echoes. These are the practices of enlightenment or the practices of Bodhi. <laughs> oh my gosh. Manjushri asked, with what hidden esoteric meaning do you say this? What do you, like, what do you mean? What do you mean? That practices that are like mirages and echoes. What do you, what, with what, esoteric hidden meaning do you say this and sumati replies herein or it's a really tricky chinese thing but she says herein i do not see the wonderful beautiful dharma as being esoteric or not esoteric manjushri asked again if this is so then every ordinary person should be enlightened. This should all logically make sense, right? If she's talking about non-discrimination is enlightenment and all of that, then, and then so Manjushri asks, well then, if what you're saying is true, then every ordinary person should be enlightened. And Sumat replies, do you mean to say that Bodhi, enlightenment, is different from the ordinary? Do not take such a view, Manjushri. Why? Because these appear as one in the Dharma Dattu. Nothing to grasp, nothing to let go of, without perfection or corruption. Okay. That, well, that's the peak. That's the peak of, of it. <laughs> And I just want to drop on you two Dharma jewels to help kind of process that. By the way, you know, and I, you probably know this, but 
the, the, whenever it gets to that level where Manjushri is going back and forth with somebody, it's always heavy. It's always deep. It always, always requires many, many readings, especially when you're trying to do a ad, you know, a quick ad hoc translation for the Chinese. Like, so it requires like multiple uh, readings in that way, but I'm going to give you these two gems to summarize what is being said here. Everybody knows these already anyways. There's a very famous uh, Zen saying that I love. It's a Zen saying of the sixth patriarch, Hui Neng. And Hui Neng, the sixth patriarch, is famous for saying that there is no difference between an enlightened person and an ordinary person. It's an enlightened person that understands that. If that gets you scratching your head or makes you kind of do a little double take of like, but, but that would mean that there's, what, but, but wait, oh, but that is very similar to the dialogue that's going on here, where it's a little, you know, they're, they're trying to use language to get around language. So it's going to be a little playful like that. The second one, though, that I want to kind of hip you to as far as the, the Dharma Datu goes there's a, another text called The Awakening of Faith in the Mahayana. And in that little text, it's actually a, a commentary in a way. There's a story about uh, a man who's lost in the woods. It's the middle of the night. There's no moon. There's no stars. He has no lamp. He's completely lost. He doesn't know north, south, east, or west. The commentary says the moment the man doesn't care where he's going, he's no longer lost. It's not about figuring out which way is north, south, east, or west. It's not about that. It's about understanding that, well, if you want to just interpret that, the idea is that being lost in the woods is being deluded and ignorant in samsara. <laughs> and you're like, Buddha, how do I get out of this? Get me off this crazy carousel, right? How do I get out of here? Is it that way? Is it that way? Is it that way? Is it down there? I'm looking, I'm lost. <laughs> the wisdom of the answer, which is the moment the man doesn't care where he's going, he's no longer lost, is a very interesting insight into the nature of being lost. That it's utterly dependent upon a lot of other factors. And you could continue to be lost if you think it's about those factors, those <laughs> in that way. So I would, I would kind of use those two to interpret this. Questions, answers, ideas about that? Feeling good? It keeps going. So this is still, this is still the text as it is in the book, but I'm still kind of reading from mine. So Manjushri is like, wow, that's crazy. That's crazy. How many people are going to be able to understand this? <laughs> and Sumati's answer is, well, it, it's, it's hard. Be, the, their, their one is not, the, there isn't, theirs isn't perfect. But the answer is, how many people can understand this? The illusory beings who understand this are equal in number to the illusory minds and mental functions. What? Yeah. My translation is, it is Sumati's answers to who, how many people can understand this? Sumati replied, it is as if illusory beings understand this with illusory minds and illusory mental functions. The, the, you know, the language is tricky in both the English translation, even in the Chinese, it, it was like, wait, what's going on? But you read enough sutras, you know, you know what's being said. The question is, is like, wow, this is super crazy. How many people can understand this? And the answer is about the, the, that, well, the answer is that it's about the illusory nature of all sentient beings. 
and the illusory nature of minds and mental functions. And so she, Sumati is kind of putting it back into Manjushri's, putting the ball back into his court and kind of saying, how many people, what people? It's as if illusory people with illusory minds understand this. And then Manjushri says, but illusory beings are originally not. They, 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 are, they don't come into being, they're not. So wait, right? Illusory beings are originally not. What is there to have a mind or mental functions? Anybody who's wrestling with the no self idea, and it's like, well, then what is there who's thinking about this no self idea? That's what's being discussed here. It's like, well, then, wait, what is there to have a mind or mental functions? Sumati replies, the Dharma Datu also neither is nor is not. Even the Tathagata, the Buddha, is like this. I believe that's where this ends. And just says like, bye. Right? It's profound. Yeah, it's very profound to say that the Dharma Datu, the realm of Dharma, this phenomenal reality, also neither is nor is not. Ah, it's gotten so late. I just got to tell you, right? If we really, this is, this is it. This is as, as profound as it will probably get tonight. If we really understand the equal nature of all dharmas, and in particular, if we really understand that, that answer, the answer that Sumati gave to Manjushri's question about like, what is enlightenment? And she says, to not discriminate any dharma, to not discriminate this from that, or good from bad, high from low, not to discriminate, that is enlightenment. When she says the Dharma Datu is also neither is nor is not, this is, this is almost as profound as Buddhism can get, which is this idea that our minds are very clear about what is the laptop, the Zoom, the, that is. You are, are all real. <laughs> Being <laughs> is, you are, right? And then there is fantasy, that which is not, right? Look, look, uh, look at the apple. No, no apple. That, that this apple is not, the laptop is. Being, non-being, true, false. The real Buddha Dharma is beyond distinctions, even those distinctions of real and not real, being and not being. Those are all delusions of the trapped mind in that sense. And by the way, being and not being, and then true or false. We, we totally operate on true and false. That's like, wait a minute, that, that's my baseline. That's my baseline for operation is true versus false. And Buddha Dharma is actually saying even that is a discrimination. And then your mind might be left wondering, well then, well then wait, what? I don't get it then. And this is what she means by nothing to grasp, nothing to let go of. Without without a mode of perfection and without a mode of corruption. Neither corrupt, not perfected, nothing to grasp, nothing to let go of. That's a very profound statement. Questions, answers, and comments about that profound statement. <laughs> or how the Buddha and the Tathagata are also neither are nor are not. Michael, I, I remember 
when we studied the Diamond Sutra. And if I recall correctly, something or you know something that was done repeatedly there was more of a both is and is not and this is a neither is and or, nor is not those are they they sound like they're similar but they're actually sort of opposites is this something that where they're co- trying to contrast with prior sutras by adding this possibility do you think oh no not necessarily i think it's a matter of just the the way this dialogue has gone the topics that they're discussing that they just hit upon this idea of of those two the being and not being (laughs) is and is not um and all of this um it i'm i would be bereft if i didn't say this but all of this leads to this kind of famous, um, this famous statement of Nagarjuna, which encapsulates this idea of Buddhist philosophy. And it's about kind of nothing is, is not, neither is nor is not, and neither is not. It's like this four part thing, is, is not, neither is nor is not and then not anything at all i'm probably not getting that entirely right but that idea of this these distinctions of reality uh is it it gets it gets, eventually gets fully blown out in that idea that's kind of closer to what you were talking about that it's neither is nor is not in that way or the vajra sutra way it's all the same idea though so mainly we're trying to get away from either is or is not and to consider this concept of uh, is and is not or either it neither neither either either or neither it it, something is is not both is and is not and neither is nor is not there i got it okay (laughs) that's all possibility and actually, while you were talking, Dean, I realized I, there's a much, much simpler way to talk about all this. Much, much simpler. Okay. It's called the middle path. <laughs> and what's so profound is that this idea of the Madhyamika, the middle path, Buddhism, the Dharma is described as the middle path, the middle way. And I would suggest that, you know, in early Buddhism, it was like, uh starve yourself or all you eat can eat buffet how about one meal a day the middle path and it's like oh great that middle path that's that's really wise and so there's a way in which the middle path is basically this kind of you know aristotelian maxim of avoiding extremes so great but what i want you to know is that that's just the beginning of the middle path, this idea of like, like, you know, not, uh, not, again, not fasting, not gorging, but just kind of trying to find the middle path to everything. What's really, really profound is that they're talking about a middle path between truth and falsehood. Our minds operate on true, false. And this is suggest or asking or suggesting that you hold this middle ground between those two and i don't know about you but my mind kind of like oh like why don't what what?" and it's that's why it's a practice this isn't something i can just tell you what the middle path is and then you're good and on your you're on your way no it's a practice to to be like oh i was really clinging to an idea of truth I was really clinging to that and I, I, I kind of blew it on that one. But don't cling to false either. It is this middle loose, you know, so it's the Dharma is always the Dharma in that way. It's just a matter of when it starts to get to cognition, perception, it's like, wow, that middle path is something else. Okay, it's 830, unfortunately. <laughs> 
I'm, I, I'm going to just have to summarize. Um, I kind of already decided I was going to uh, stop at four for Sumati. Um, and at this point, you, you all don't even have it. So I think it's fine to stop it. But I do just want you to know that the dialogue keeps going with Manjushri. Um, and that basically, uh, yeah, it gets crazy, but it's, it's another thing that like, I wonder, like, uh, and I actually wanted to have a talk tonight about why you all thought maybe they left this stuff out. But what's fascinating is that after Maguyayana bows down to Sumati, Manjushri, after this back and forth, Manjushri says this great thing, and I haven't figured out the exact, exactly what he's saying, but the gist of what he's saying is he's like, man, I've been to every Buddha land you can imagine from in time immemorable. And I've never, it's this beautiful phrase that he basically says, I've never met such a, a dear friend as you. And it's like, almost brings me to tears, this idea, you know? And again, what's happening here is like the elder male bowing down the, I mean, we, we know Manjushri, Shri, he's top, top 10th, 10th boomy stage. He's 10th stage Bodhisattva. And so for him to also be like, wow, I've never met anyone like you. That's a big statement and it's unfortunate to leave it out. But, and then in classic form, Manjushri asks, why don't you change out of your female form? We've seen this one every single time that eventually somebody says to the female who has proven to be smarter than everybody else, they eventually say, wow, you're so amazing. Why don't you just pop out of your female body then? And basically, Sumati lets Manjushri have it. And again, she says, don't, she says basically something like, don't ask such a deluded question. Then she says this beautiful thing, and I, I want to really get my translation right eventually, but she says this beautiful thing about how the female form is very hard to perceive. So amazing. But then also in classic form, she transforms into a 30-year-old monk. She does the transformation of the physical body out of the female form into the male form to show everybody that she can do it. And it says that she, she transforms into a, a uh, 30 year old male monk. Everybody's like, wow. Um, and then she kind of starts going off about her Buddha land that will be, and it's going to have trees of the seven treasures and all of the stuff. And, and more or less, it kind of wraps up from that into this kind of great uh, glorification of Sumati. The most important part about this, though, is there's a, a scholar named Diana Paul. She has a very famous book called Women in Buddhism. It's excerpts of all these Mahayana sutras that deal with the feminine and deal with the role of women in Buddhism. She has these different chapters in that book. And in that book, she describes female bodhisattvas with, without transformation, where they don't have to become a male. And then another chapter is all these excerpts where the female sort of has to become a male first, and then she becomes a Buddha. In this sutra, she became a full, she achieved the state of completion in the female body had a discourse with Madhuryana Manjushri, they bow down, and then she turns into a male to kind of show that she can do it. But it is by no means a requisite to her enlightenment. So, you know, if you get a, if you get a hold of uh, Diana Paul's book and you look at that, you'll see that some sutras stick to this, this little problem where the female has to become male first, but not all of them. And so I'm, I'm just going to kind of leave it on that glorifying note of the, the uh, young uh, Sumati showing us all. <laughs> so, 
So thank you, Sumati. Thank you all so much for listening. Um, uh, questions and answers, of course, but I just want to say that that's going to do it for our lovely Sumati Dadaka Sutra. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Happy to do it. Questions, comments, answers, epiphanies? Anything come up? I know it's a little past the time. Feeling good? It's a juicy sutra. Very juicy sutra. It, it, it's super juicy. It's I like the, you know, it's not anything and it's something and, you know, check the oven. I mean, they're just all over the place with repetition and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and sort of mind benders, but are, the, is it, I mean, it's sort of like, it's, it's addressing it to me. It sounded like, it's sort of like, this is folding, a a, a real, like, um, understanding the truth of emptiness, you know, and then walking around and not walking into trees and, you know, making a fool of yourself, like, 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 uh, understanding emptiness to the to the point where, like, even though you can be in the physical world and and whatever, you you always you always sort of have a detached sense of, like, you know, I'm I'm creating the truth of the things that are around me, and um, and that should remain a little squishy. Is that is that <laughs> is that okay for you? Does that not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On no yeah you know have used when you know this sutra talks a lot about the dharma the what one of our sutras called the concatenation of all events in the universe huh? right and so this idea of yeah. the totality as one monolithic whole concatenation of all events it, you know the you know there's a lot of ways that this you know uh i can divide the the border of the whiteboard from the whiteboard yeah i can divide this from that but there's also that primordial division of me from all everything else mm. and so i would just say that you know this isn't about like i always say about emptiness Emptiness doesn't mean that all of a sudden things start disappearing on you or that you become a mindless zombie zombie bumping into things because you don't know any better. It's about sort of a piercing view into the nature of reality and understanding the role that discrimination has in the creation of that reality and not getting duped by it. Mm. Awesome. Thank you. Something like that. That, no, that, 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 that really, yeah, that clarifies stuff quite a bit. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Today was My awesome. My pleasure, man. Good to see you, Brendan. All right, folks. Um, if that's it, I just want you to know that I think next week we'll start a new sutra also from the Ratnakuta. Um, and I think just so you know, I think we're going, I think it's a good segue actually to do a Manjushri Sutra. Manjushri kind of finishing this one out. So I'm going to scratch and uh, mix us right into it. And so there is, I believe it's called Manjushri's Discourse on the Paramita of Wisdom. That's what it is. It's a uh, sutra number six in the book, Ratnakuta number 46. That's where we're going to start next Sunday on the Dharma Doors. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. Thanks. Thank you so much, Michael. Hey, everyone, just uh, put it on your calendar. Michael will be back on September 15th for our Wise Action, which is also happening this coming Tuesday and the following Tuesday. And uh, don't forget to check out the Lewis Underground for more juicy Michael stuff. MC on. Thanks, Michael. That was amazing. Real, real workout. Real workout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so th this is this. This will all culminate in a fresh translation of this whole sutra. I. Pr